What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. It is finally time to get our electrolytes on and today we're gonna to be looking at hypokalemia. So in order to understand what hypokalemia is, we need to know what potassium is. So what's a normal range for potassium? Well, it's 3.5 to 5 milli equivalents per liter. And the main functions of potassium is it is the most abundant intracellular cation. It is a positively charged ion. It transmits electrical impulses. It also helps with our acid-base balances when it comes to hydrogen and potassium. They're both positively charged ions and they balance each other out. So they can both be found in the cell and outside of our cells. If we have an increase in potassium in our cell, then hydrogen is going to move out. Whereas if we have increased hydrogen in our cells, then potassium is going to move out. They help balance each other out. It's a beautiful relationship that they have. A major, they have a major role in heart and skeletal muscle contractions. It helps maintain heart and muscle contraction as well as regulate our kidneys, and it also helps influence our aldosterone. So it's important to note that with every 0.1 decrease in pH, we will have a 0.5 increase in potassium. That's that balance that we were talking about with our hydrogen and our potassium. So as our pH is decreasing, our potassium is going to start becoming heavily elevated. So what are we looking at when we're looking at low potassium ranges? So less than 3.5 milli equivalents per liter. And the causes for this are actual total body potassium losses. So excessive use of medications such as potassium wasting diuretics. That's our loop diuretics such as our LASIK as well as our thiazide diuretics. And corticosteroid use. So water retention causes hemodilution leading to hypokalemia. Increased secretion of aldosterone, such as with our Cushing's disease patients. Aldosterone plays a major role in potassium excretion through the kidneys. The higher levels of aldosterone causes more potassium excretion leading to hypokalemia. Vomiting, diarrhea, and prolonged nasogastric suctioning can also cause this. Excessive diuresis as well as kidney disease impairing reabsorption of potassium. Osmotic diuresis is another one because it increases um, the urine excretion of certain substances in the small tubes of the kidneys. Additional causes can be inadequate potassium intake if the patient is fasting or if they are in nothing uh, per mouth status, like they're going for a procedure or some surgery the next day. A movement of potassium from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid, well, how is that done? So we could have excessive insulin. Insulin brings potassium into the cell. So if we're pushing all of this potassium into the cell, then our serum potassium is going to drop, leading to hypokalemia. We also have alkalosis. We talked about that before when it came to our hydrogen and our potassium. They're both found inside the cell. In alkalosis, there's less hydrogen in the blood vessel, causing hydrogen to shift out of the cells, leading to a serum potassium also shifting into the cells. So they have a kind of an inverse relationship. If there is potassium being excreted from the cells, into our blood vessels, then that serum potassium that's hanging out there is going to start shifting back into our cells so that way we have a good relationship between our cells and the fluid in our bodies. So that's something you'll see with a lot of our alkalosis patients. As we have a pH that's being influenced by that hydrogen, you're going to start seeing those hypokalemias. Also dilution of serum potassium with water intoxication that we have discussed in a previous video. That is highly a reason we would develop hypokalemia as well as IV therapy with potassium deficient solutions. So if we're giving a whole bunch of normal saline, we're going to start to dilute our serum potassiums. Whereas if we give lactated ringers, we know that there's potassium inside of that. So that could potentially help offset a lot of those potassium deficits. So when we're talking about a patient presentation when it comes to hypokalemia, you need to think hypokalemia, hypoactive, low, and slow. We don't have all of that extra potassium that's excitable to our skeletal muscles, 
causing everything to be low and slow. So when it comes to our cardiovascular system, you're gonna see thready, weak, irregular pulses. We're also gonna have weak peripheral pulses and even orthostatic hypotension and dysrhythmias. Anytime we have any kind of electrolyte imbalance, you're most likely gonna see some kind of dysrhythmia. That's what's gonna be on your NCLEX, make sure you know that. Respiratory systems, we're gonna have shallow, ineffective respirations that result from profound weakness of that skeletal muscle's um, ability for respiration, like we said, low and slow. If we've got low potassium, we don't have that excitability on our skeletal muscles leading to weakness for our respirations and thus causing diminished breath sounds. When it comes to our neuromuscular system, we're gonna have altered mental status. So you're gonna see anxiety, lethargy, confusion, and maybe even a coma, depending on how severe the hypokalemia is. Skeletal muscle weakness, leg cramps because of that decrease in potassium, loss of tactile discrimination, paresthesias, and deep tendon hyporeflexia. When it comes to our gastrointestinal system, again, think low and slow. So we're gonna have a decrease in motility, hypoactive, or even absent bowel sounds nausea, vomiting, constipation, abdominal distension, and you can even see a paralytic ileus. This is extremely important to know. It's a priority. You probably will see this on your NCLEX. It's a portion of the bowels that are not moving that can lead to a small bowel obstruction. So they want to make sure that when you have a patient that has hypokalemia, we know that everything is going to be low and slow. Paralytic ileuses can occur. When it comes to our laboratory findings, we know that our serum potassium is going to be lower than 3.5 milli equivalents per liter, and we're going to see electrocardiogram changes. So again, everything is low and slow. We're going to have ST depression, shallow, flat, or inverted T waves, and also prominent U waves may be present depending on the severity of the hypokalemia. So what interventions are we going to be looking at with our hypokalemic patients? Well, we want to make sure that we're monitoring those cardiac and respiratory statuses because as we know, hypokalemia is going to cause everything to be low and slow. So you're going to start to see dysrhythmias when it comes to our cardiovascular system as well as those shallow respirations when it comes to our respiratory system. We want to treat the cause and prevent additional losses of potassium for occurring. So we do this by monitoring electrolyte values and we also want to administer potassium supplements either orally or intravenously depending on how it's prescribed. It's extremely important to note that when we are administering potassium, we want to administer it slowly because KCL, potassium chloride is what we're giving, can be lethal to our patients if it is given too fast. So you wanna make sure that you're giving it over that hour or two hour period depending on the uh, milli equivalents that are in the bag that you're providing. We need to institute safety measures for the client experiencing muscle weakness. So we wanna make sure that they don't fall and hurt themselves. If the client is taking a potassium losing diuretic, it must be discontinued and a potassium sparing, which is our retaining uh, potassium diuretic, is to be used, such as spirolactone. It's a potassium sparing diuretic. We also want to instruct our patient about foods that are high in potassium content. They really should be ingesting these foods to help offset that low potassium. So things like banana, kale, and avocados are great options for our hypokalemic patients. And as we wrap up this hypokalemia video, I want to give you some hypokalemia and NCLEX tips. These are things that you need to know to help you pass your nursing exams and your NCLEX. So when you hear things like profound and severe, these are usually late and serious signs. These aren't gonna be early signs that something's happening. So if you have profound hypotension, that's a very late and serious sign. When it comes to potassium, it should never, ever be administered by IV push, intramuscularly, or subcutaneously. IV potassium is always diluted and administered using an infusion device. Like we talked about before, KCL is highly lethal, so you're not gonna give this IV push, and you definitely don't wanna start injecting it into their body. You don't wanna put it in their muscles or in their fatty tissues. So you wanna make sure that it is going through an intravenous device at the set rate dependent on the milli equivalents within the bag. I hope that this video was helpful for you in passing your nursing exams 
like a boss. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Make sure that you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe as well as like this video. I also have a website at www.nursechung.com where I will have NCLEX style questions as well as additional resources with each of my videos. So make sure that you check that out. But until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I will speak with you all again soon. Bye.